Let's go to the mailbag. That's a good reach. Great info, better banter. I love this pot. This is from Cat Hasselback, uh, presumably the third brother of the Hasselback family. I love this podcast. And or maybe it's Matt Hasselback's cat. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's with a K. Cats don't know how to spell their cats. <laughs> don't they? <laughs> my wife thinks that my dog has feelings. He's a dog. Possible. My dogs do have feelings. There's a difference between feelings and being able to spell the word cat. I don't know <laughs> what you're confused about there. Do you think it's your to dog to find out? You know, it's going to get angry and bark. I, well, my problem, like, she's like, he won't stop doing this. And this. It's like, well, then you have to discipline him. She's like, but he has feelings. You can't discipline a dog. It's like, you can't train a dog unless you train a dog. This you know, I won't be trained until you train the dog. Uh, anyway, back to Cat Hasselback. I love this podcast. It helps me get through my work day. Brinson is hilarious. You, you bet. This is a Brinson burner account. <laughs> has to be. Breach is fine. <laughs> Nobody cares about kickers, LOL. <laughs> and as a black man myself, it defies all logic that Ryan Wilson is black. But okay, I will take your word for it, LOL. That made me laugh. That was a good one. I like <laughs> cackling. Mailbag question. Is Alex Smith the most successful NFL player in terms of money? The man has signed three, like $300 million contract. Seems like he got the old rookie deal every penny and he signed an extension with the chiefs and Washington. If your goal is just to make money and not necessarily be a champion in the NFL, it seems like Alex Smith is the blueprint. Hmm, interesting question. Yeah, it is interesting. You know what? As soon as I read this question, the first thing I thought, and I had to look it up to uh, figure out if it was correct the first name that came to mind for not any success, but making a ton of money, Matthew Stafford. Uh, you know, he's oh. just been out in Detroit. They don't get anywhere in the playoffs. I don't think they've ever made it out of the wild card round with him. Uh, and he has made, and he's number one overall pick in 2009. So over the course of his career, and this is not include what he'll make in 2021. So this is just through 2020. He has made $226 million dollars which is the ninth highest total in NFL history. Alex Smith is actually 10th at 189 million. So I'm giving the tenth title 10th of, of quarterbacks or 10th all time, 10th all time out of any position. Where, where are you getting that? I was looking on spot track. I am getting it from my trusty list that I made by calculating every contract that went out for the past 40 years. Uh, called, you could have called, just, you could have called, just called spot track. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if you are looking on spot track. What you thought he added it all up. This is a man who thinks cats can spell dogs. Doesn't have feelings. And <laughs> uh, reach out up every single person's contract in the history. Of Where am I missing Alex Smith on here? Cause you have to click the button that says all time as, as opposed to active. It only shows you active players and they have him as inactive since he's not on the team right now. Ah, uh, there we go. I was wondering where the Manning brothers. Were. I was like, what is happening here? Uh, it is interesting that Eli fourth all time actually made more on the field than Peyton did. And while those guys are the wealthiest of all time in terms of earnings, a lot of that, a lot of that's fueled by their excessive endorsements, Papa John's Timex, uh, Eli's adult diaper line. I, think hot, gotta, hot sauce too. I mean, obviously we could point out that Philip rivers could qualify here. No, I think, oh. Al, I think Philip rivers has had more success. Okay, and I think, I think that's where because Philip I mean, Rivers has been to an AFC title game. You know, like Matthew yeah, Stafford has I mean, never made it. Matthew Stafford has never won a playoff game. You know, he's he, we hear that about Andy Dalton all the time, but somehow Matthew Stafford has avoided that conversation, even though he was a number one overall pick, uh, who only led the Lions to the playoffs, I think, three times, and they went zero and three. May I? May I suggest? I mean, look, based on the raw numbers, yes, Matthew Stafford works. May I humbly suggest that Sam Bradford deserves at least a discussion here because he's 16th all time for quarterbacks. Uh, one spot behind Brett Favre, who's in the Hall of Fame. Bradford made $130 million in his NFL career. Like he was he they made the did they make the playoffs that one year, his first year? That one year. <laughs> I mean, he was traded all around. I mean, I, and I like Bradford. I thought he could have been better, but I mean, he. Um, but, but part of the reason that, um, and this actually does include Matthew Stafford as well. Alex Smith is on that. Well, I guess it does include Bradford too. That's right. They're all on the old old deals for the rookie contracts because five yes. this one. So that that didn't happen until 2011 with Cam Newton, I think. It was just kind of remarkable that Cam Newton is 18th, uh, despite you know not having, um, you know, played on yep. the. 
the old the old CBA deal. And no, yeah, Sam Bradford never made the playoffs. I think if you were doing like a Mount- uh, well, what, that there's a little oh boy. a disclaimer there. He actually made the playoffs. He Not went two and zero with the Vikings in 2017. Got injured. Case Keenum took over, and they went to the NFC. He was undefeated that year. We got to give him a little bit of credit. And then he got injured, and then Keenum took him to the MC title game. Yeah, because that was the year that uh, the Eagles traded him when because Teddy Bridgewater blew out his knee. Uh, the Eagles felt that Carson Wentz was good enough to start, and they traded Sam Bradford to Minnesota for a first round pick. Hey, listen to this. I was thinking about this the other day because I heard somewhere I was just reminded, of course, that Carson Wentz is going to be the starting quarterback for the Colts. Imagine if two years—I think it was two years ago—if someone said two years ago when Andrew Luck had yet to retire. Hey man, two years from now, Carson Wentz is going to be a starting quarterback for the Colts. Like, what would have to happen in your mind? <laughs> like, what what are the gymnastics you're doing that? Okay, well, like, does uh, Angel get hit by an asteroid? Like, does Carson Wentz have him put a put a hit out? Like, what happens? <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, and <laughs> I mean, imagine going back in time the week before Andrew Luck retires because it was right before training camp, right? It was in was it in August. Was it even in September? I think it was in August because Sean. Yeah, it was in August. It was at the end of August. Late August. Yeah, Sean was out having drinks, and Wilson will never forgive him for it. Because we're trying to do a podcast. He's like, I'll be home in two hours. But anyway, go ahead. But, I mean, that was, I mean, obviously pre-pandemic. Imagine, like, breaking down. to go The week before Andrew Luck retires, you go to that, you go to someone like, listen, here's what's going to unfold over the course of the next two years. And, by the way, Carson Wentz will be the starting quarterback for the Colts. No one would. <laughs> Or, or you I said, mean, you could me throw in, in the next two years in life and with the Colts quarterback situation. If August 1st, 2019, you say Wentz is the, the Colts quarterback. Uh, you don't know what's going on with Andrew Luck. And you say Jared Goff's not with the Rams anymore because this is six months after he led them to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Your mind's even more blown. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, so I think if you're doing like the Mount Rushmore here, I think, I think the nod is to Stafford. And I, I agree. Like you can't put no, Matt no, no. Ryan on the Mount Mushmore. Mount Mushmore, yeah. That's Mount Cashmore. <laughs> Mount Cashmore. That's good. Thank you. Um, Matt Ryan, you know, doesn't have a – we're not going to just do guys who don't have Super Bowls because that's not fair. Matt Ryan has an MVP, went through a Super Bowl. Phillip Rivers, very, you know, one game away from a Super Bowl. Stafford's up there. Alex Smith has playoff runs, though. Runs? He went in Kansas City. Playoff limps? They never went – he went – he went – so Ka- Kaepernick started that year. He started halfway through the season, I think. I think that year they went to the Super Bowl and lost to the Ravens. Alex Smith started, and then Kaepernick took over for him. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, he's two and he has seven playoff games. Two and five in the playoffs. Is that enough to get him off the list? No, because I think the contract that the football team took on for him was so out of the ordinary, insane. For I mean, well, well, he went to he went to an NFC championship game, right? Yeah. He's, he's a slightly above replacement. Level he lost the N or he didn't, but the 49ers lost the NFC title game in 2011 that they should have won. I was actually at that game in the stadium as a fan. And that was where I think the 49ers fumbled two punt returns and that set up two giants touchdowns. And that those were the only two touchdowns the Giants scored. And then uh, you know, obviously, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I can't believe I'm doing this, but is so Alex Smith going to an NFC championship game in 2011 doesn't equate to whatever Philip Rivers did. No, I think okay. they're different conversations. Okay. I mean, right. No so, one's talking about your drive. And we should throw out real quick. All five of his playoff losses were by one score. Mm. You're driving the Philip Rivers as a Hall of Famer bandwagon. No one's driving that for Alex Smith. Okay, that's fair. All right, so Stafford is the the patron saint of uh, money with no success. Although I I believe he'll flip that uh, this year. I, I have an honorable right? mention. I well hold on. Oh, I, I I still think Alex Smith is ahead of Matthew Stafford. I think Matthew Stafford is a vic, is a victim of circumstance in large part, not a victim of. Don't uh-huh. make that face at me, Breach. No, you Matthew Stafford, your number yeah. one overall pick. You create the circumstance. You you win a playoff. He has not won a playoff game, Ryan. How can you put you him ahead the, of Alex? You know the other Stafford, one. Stafford's also got. Two, he's at 226 in 12 seasons. Smith's at 189 in 16. Seasons. You know the other number one overall pick with zero playoff wins? Uh, Joe, uh, Joe Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the list. Put him on the I list. I thought for sure you were going to say Andy Dalton. I was mentally prepared um, for that one. Wasn't name, ready for name, Joe Burrow. A name that we haven't mentioned who has to be on here, Kirby Cousins. 
but he is a fourth round pick who got who's done more with He's less. 14th all time in quarterback earnings. Yeah, but I think part of the issue, and Bruce touched on it with Stafford, he was number one overall. Like he was the second quarterback taken by football team that year, Kirby Cousins. <laughs> yeah, but the question didn't have to do with the draft pick. It was who's the most successful player in terms of money that has done like and in, the, in fact, if you think fewest. about if you think about cousins at 140 million, like he did he was on the new CBA and was a fourth round pick. So you're talking, you know, he's starting behind, he's starting like $80 million behind Matthew Stafford and is like kind of closed the gap a little bit here. Right. Um, right. Bradford. So those would be the, f- the big four. Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler. I already said it. Uh, now, here's a- Carson Palmer. Carson. No, he went to the AFC championship game until the Steelers killed you're just him. Bitter Cause he retired. What? That he was the care. wild card round. He didn't get to the AFC title game. He had to the NFC title game with the Cardinals. There you go. I'll tell you who is creeping on this list. Carson Palmer needs to be on this list. Oh, Gary Carr. Oh, stop it. I don't even know. Where is he? What's he 91 doing? million is 25th all time. Jimmy G, 26th all time. Matt Schaub, 24th all time. Incredible. All right, let's move on. All right. Oh, so, my, my honorable mention, though, real quick, was Chase uh, Daniel, who's made $37 million, only five starts in his career. He's not, he's not being a second. He, he should be like number two on the list. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, a good point. That's exactly the type of player you're talking about. You don't know how to do lists. That is right? a dream job. <laughs> you don't, your body is in near perfect condition. He is most certainly you, a scratch golfer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, by all accounts, I've, I've, I haven't, I don't, I've, I haven't met him or interviewed him at, at length, but I've interacted briefly with him at the Super Bowl. Really, really nice guy. Great. I love nice people. All right, Five that? stars plus mailbag. Discovered this pod last summer. I've listened to every episode since. Jeez, so peace. Thanks. This is from Fight on Dan via Apple Podcast. It is my go-to for all things NFL. Question, if you were the GM of an expansion franchise and had your choice of the following on how to start your franchise in the draft, what would you choose? Option A, take the quarterback prospect who is labeled as once in a generation, Andrew Luck, Trevor Lawrence type prospect, or, or option B, your choice of any non QB offensive prospect and your choice of any defensive prospect, both of whom project to be all pros at their respective positions. Wilson, as our junior draft analyst, mm-hmm. let's thoughts first. I mean, uh, this seems pretty easy to me. You're taking the quarterback. Uh, you can have Chase Young and Joey Bosa and Joe Thomas and uh, Julio Jones all day long. But if you got Duck Hodges or Ryan Finley throwing in the ball, it, it doesn't matter especially if you're throwing the ball to Chase Young and, and he's played defensive end. But my point uh, stands. Uh, you take Joe Burrow, you take Andrew Luck, you take uh, this year Trevor Lawrence, and, and then you worry about the rest of that stuff later. It also depends, Breach, I think, on – like for me, the qualification of uh, – you know, the, the way that it's being framed in terms of the prospect who's once in a generation. So if you're giving me Peyton Manning, John Elway – Andrew Luck or Trevor Lawrence, I'm, it's a no-brainer. You're taking that. I mean, it's why the Browns, it's why the it Colts turned down the Browns' uh, Herschel Walker offer in 2012 for that number one pick because it you just you take the I think you just take the 2012. What why'd you say 2012? Yeah, um, the Mike Holmgren offered Ryan Grigson his entire draft over iced tea at the pool. Oh, oh, for I see. Andrew Not Luck. for Herschel Walker, the Herschel Walker, no, the Herschel Walker style deal. Yeah, like Herschel Walker was 50. <laughs> it's not a very good trade offer. And even if you have one of the best defensive players, one of the best offensive players, that doesn't guarantee you success. And I would use the Houston Texans as an example. Before they had drafted Deshaun Watson, they had DeAndre Hopkins, one of the best receivers in football. They had J.J. Watt, who was in his prime at the time, and they weren't winning Super Bowls with those two guys. So I think you have a better chance. And just because you get that generational quarterback doesn't mean you're going to win a Super Bowl, but I think you have a better chance of getting to a Super Bowl and maybe winning if you have the generational quarterback versus having the top non QB offensive guy or just the top defensive guy. I would concur with that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a crazy idea. I think that it needs to be, I think if you were going to go for the prospect route, it would need to be, you get a random first round quarterback from the last 10 years. You don't know who it is. It's like randomly spits out a name. Would you do that, or would you take two pros, two Pro Bowl prospects? Or would you rather have a kicker who can hit an 80-yard field goal 100% of the time? An 80-yard field goal? An 80-yard field goal 100% of the time, 
or like the ninth best quarterback in the NFL. Why why stop at 80 since you're making stuff up? Why not make it 110? Well, because we've seen it. we've seen people hit 80. We've never seen 110 no, in practice. Justin well, Tucker has video of him hitting 79. If you had a quarterback, if you had a kicker who could make an 80 yard field goal 100 percent of the time, what are we doing? Which is the stupid <laughs> thing anyone's ever said. <laughs> would you um would you how soon would you kick the field goal? Well, I mean, you're basically you're in the field goal like, range. You, all you have to do is to score touchdowns and risk a turnover or just kick on first down. All you have to do is get five yards. So a touchback takes you to the 20, 20 or 20, the 25 now. 25, so you yeah. get five yards or in field goal range after a touchback. I mean, this, I can't believe we're having this conversation. So you, I mean, it, what I'm that, taking the I, kicker. Think could, I think you could win the Super Bowl without <laughs> a quarterback if you had a kicker who could make an 80 yard field goal because you would take the touchback you would run you would just get five yards you have two or three plays get five yards and then you just kick the field goal and play defense what are we doing i mean if that if you could do like you I, hear that wilson brinson would take the kicker over the ninth best quarterback of the nfl ninth best quarterback of all time. remember like in the 90s like in high school uh, or younger, you would try to watch like a uh, Cinemax between the fuzzy lines and cable. Yeah, yeah. Instead of doing that, Breach was coming up with these crazy plans of these robot kickers that could never miss a field goal. That's what Breach was doing. <laughs> I mean, imagine making an 80 yard field goal 100%, 100% of the time. time. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Here's the thing you can do that, but he can't go into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> just, just to spite you. Yeah, you only have him for one year. <laughs> um, All right. Meanwhile, Debo 10 minutes ago, so let's move on. Mailbag question from SLC 87 Skull. Dear sirs, the Pick Six podcast is one of the best NFL podcasts about is is one of the best NFL podcasts around. Sorry, I can't read. I listen to every show and love the banter between y'all. Do you think this year's draft will really show the difference between teams that scout well and in advance and those who don't? Skull Vikings, Sam Langley, Clifford. Um, I, th I think all teams scout well. I mean. They have huge scouting departments, and they've been doing this for over a year. And they just don't draft well. That's right. And I think what happens, and when you talk to people, what, what you find out is that what happens is that um, coaches come to the party late because coaches aren't scouting these guys. Coaches don't get involved until after the season's over. Coaches come late to the party, and then there are guys that they love, and that may just that, that may uh, create some friction with, with what the scouting department likes. And then also, and this may be less than an example this year because it's uh, these opportunities are fewer and far between with no combines we're used to seeing it and pro days being a little different. Sometimes front office guys fall in love with guys they see have good pro days. So that can still happen. I mean, Travis ATN and Clemson had their pro day on Thursday. ATN ran an unofficial four forward. I'm sure that'll make some people excited, but I, I think what'll happen is the teams that are on the same page, the best will probably have the most success in terms of trusting what the scouts have been doing for 12, 13, 14 months now, as opposed to, there being friction in, in the draft room with guys who haven't watched all these players as closely because they're coaches or whatever. Um, and maybe that happens with teams that are with new coaching staffs and new front offices. We'll, we'll have to see how this unfolds. You never, I mean, the thing about this is you won't know for two or three or four years, but I don't think um, all teams like scout, they, they have, I mean, they all, they have 10, 15, 20 scouts and all that other stuff. So I, I think that's not going to be the issue. The issue is just people being on the same page. Uh, I will just say that I don't think the Bengals have 20 scouts. <laughs> <laughs> not. No. Um, I mean, I think you'll see, I don't know if it's advanced scouting, but I do think you'll see maybe people trust the film a little bit more. I think they did that last year to a certain extent. I mean, it's, I've, I've never felt less knowledgeable about a draft like in my entire life, not as a professional, but like less knowledgeable on a draft um, than really this year's draft. And I don't know if that's a byproduct of there being less college football guys opting out um, it being a weird draft class. That's not particularly, I mean, like does this draft, I don't feel like this draft class is good. Well, I'll also say that good. real quick that you're talking about, if you opted out that guy, that means these people have not played football since December 2019. In the top offensive linemen, like guys will be taken in the top 10, haven't played football since December 2019. And so by the time you're back on the field, it's been more than 18 months. I mean, 20 months. So you have no idea what that kind of time off. And, and football is not an easy sport to like stay in shape for unless you're actually playing football. Imagine how hard the 80 yard kicker guy has to work to stay in shape. <laughs> 
But I mean, like, think about these offensive linemen because you see dudes, all these, every single one of these dudes, like Joe Thomas or Jordan Gross, they retire and immediately lose 89 pounds. And just like uh, within a week. So, I mean, how is Panay Panay Sewell just pounding like Whataburgers or whatever? Uh, I will say this. Debo and I talked to Levi Onzerike, who's a defensive tackle out of Washington. And I asked him, I said, so what has been better for you? Playing, like he opted out, playing in 2020, would that have been better for you? Or going straight to the facility that your agent's paying 20 grand a month or whatever it costs to get you, you know, get you in shape, have all these trainers, you're training for all these drills, your whatever, your diet's taken care of. And he said, I wanted to play with my teammates, blah, 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 but this has actually been good. And you talk to agents like this may happen more often, like guys just opting out uh, because what what's in it for them? Injury just, risk, injury risk way down. I don't know. I have no idea where the name image likeness conversation is. I don't pay much attention to that. Right. So I don't know how far along that is, but if these guys aren't getting paid, what? Yeah, exactly. What, what are you doing? It's a good point. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know. I don't know that the advanced scouting will show up so much as I think that you will get the people who are. So the, the issue that you hear about from these teams and Ryan, maybe you can speak more to this, but the problem for these scouts is that they haven't, usually they get onto campus and they talk to all these people around campus on campus, um, you know, coaches, friends, cafeteria workers, they find out everything they can about these players to, you know, because NFL teams are psychotic and they believe that, you know, you can find out what these people are like when the, when the lights aren't on them and when they're off the field and that matters from a character standpoint, and all of that. So like, that's sort of the, like you you really don't have the opportunity to trust that you're meeting with these guys over zoom. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're going off of the film and the tape. And so I think guys who have, you know, there's no combine, right? I mean, I think that the tape, it's not so much advanced scouting so much as like you're going to maybe see distinguished who are the best um, teams at identifying quality players based on film study. Does that make sense? Does that seem fair? Yeah. And a lot of these scouts I talked to didn't, weren't able to go to practice during the fall because of the pandemic. Exactly. They would go to the games, but I mean, you, you can't go to the game and, learn much you can see a player up close and personal you can see him on the field see what it looks like but yeah i mean if you're in the box you're wearing a mask you're not and if you're if you're interested in the safety what are you gonna watch the safety for 50 snaps but you can't replay it so you're gonna go back and watch the the film anyway when you get it so you're sort of just getting the feel of the person maybe you have a chance to talk with some some assistant coaches or, or maybe you don't but that, that's sort of what has been lost but that's lost for for every team so then again it goes back to relationships and who do you know and and how that's, that's a great point yeah like the, 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 so like Bill Belichick can call basically any school, call a coach and be like, Hey, it's Bill Belichick. And like, you know, obviously he knows Nick Saban. Um, you know, he's, he's very, yeah, there was a thing last, last year, he went to like some small school in Tennessee and worked some guy out in the rain. Like there's a middle Tennessee of, state right down go. the street from hey, me. And he came Murphy, to, he came to Raleigh. He was grinding on, uh, in the indoor practice facility over by Carter Finley. There you go. He and Dave Doran are buddies, apparently. All right, let's. So, th so that's how that's probably how it will affect it. It will certainly be different. Not as different. Actually, I guess it would be more different than last year because you yeah, basically you're... had the whole season. Yeah, you just had to change things up in March. Right. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, more mailbag. All right, five star pick six. Oh, I read that wrong. Runner fourteen seventy eight ask says best NFL show out there. Thank you. Question. Assuming crowds get closer to normal this coming season, are you guys expecting to try to take advantage of either overcompensating or slow to compensate sports books? Um, I, I think what he's saying is that if, do we think that sports books will properly adjust to fans in the stands? Breach. I think this is an interesting question because I, I think this happens uh, every year, the first one, two, three weeks of the season, no matter what, you're you're really just trying to compensate how teams react to anything, what their changes mean. Because uh, you look at last season without fans, uh, home teams had a losing record for the first time ever. They went, they won 127 games, lost 128 games, and there was one tie. But then you look at 2019, home teams went 132, 123, and one. So it was only a five-game difference between a year where there was no fans and a year where, you know, every stadium was sold out. So it's hard to kind of gauge what kind of difference fans really make. Maybe a, a few teams, if you have a rookie quarterback who, 
Uh, you know, just getting the NFL, all of a sudden they're playing in front of crowds after not playing in front of any crowds in college. So there could be an adjustment period for quarterbacks. And I think that's something you should always watch. And week one or two is, is there may be teams that you can value more because uh, they, there's some sort of adjustment period where Vegas is either overvaluing or undervaluing them. So I, I don't think it's independent of the fans coming back. It's just something you should watch out for each year. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting one breach because I've sort of been wondering this as it relates to the PGA tour. Um, all these young guys who have sort of come onto the tour in the last year have sort of one turn, like Colin Morikawa won his major at the PGA championship at Harding park with no fans. Like it's a whole different ball game. If there are fans in the, in, in the, in, you know, their galleries following you around like throngs of people watching every shot. And so I sort of wonder how that will affect those guys. And I think yeah, you, you, about- to your point, sorry to interrupt you, but I was actually thinking about this uh, because back in the day when tiger was a thing, the tiger roar is what would upset so many other players on the course. Oh, yeah. You don't have to worry about that now. No, you would be like, cause it, and you would have to step away from your team. Out of your butt. To Augusta. <laughs> I have. Uh, but like you, and I, I was on, a you are the poster person for someone who's definitely been to Augusta. We know that you <laughs> twice, um, on my own dime as a patron. Thank you. Um, CBS won't let me go. Uh, the, um, you wonder why <laughs> yeah, shocked. Um, the, you can hear the, like when something happens anywhere on the course, it is that roar that they talk about is legitimate. Like you can hear it coming. And that's what the tiger thing was. It was, Like, you knew where Tiger was, Tiger makes a big shot, and all of a sudden, everyone is peeing down their leg because they know that Tiger's on the prowl. A little more effective than looking up at the leaderboard and seeing the the old guy change the numbers. Oh, Tiger got a birdie on 16. I should worry. Right. Um, So, I think that's really interesting with these young quarterbacks. You know, now, they've probably all played enough in college atmospheres that it's not as big a deal, but certainly, I think that'll make a difference. I mean, you, you hear from all these players and coaches that playing in this season was really, it felt like a souped up practice, you know, like an official, like an official scrimmage or something like that, which is a vastly different environment. As far as the sports books go, I don't think there will be a massive adjustment as it relates to the fans in particular. But we have seen in certain cases that you can get like you can get an advantage over the book. For instance, early on in the season, there was some thought process that with the minimal practice time that we would see a lot of unders hit. But the NFL sort of, you know, gave a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the officials and were like, don't call holding. And with no holding calls being called overs where everything was flying over early on. And so I think I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that there's a chance that home field advantage could be improved if stadiums are full, but I think that home field advantage had largely been nullified enough in most spots that there will not be a significant sports book advantage, but I think it's a very good question. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Five-star pick six mailbag question from a lions fan. I am so sorry. This is from (laughs) B dubs Four. Oh, from Brandon Worth in Reed City, Michigan. Thank you for including that at the top. If, if you want, if you want your name read, include that. Thanks, Brandon. First off, absolutely love your guys' show. Appreciate you. The in-depth analysis, avid passion, and hysterical comedy brings awesome content to my daily drives. Keep up the great work. Strong emoji. For my question, as a Lions fan, the last couple of years have been nothing short of tough. What experiences have you guys had where your team is in rough shape? Oh boy. And what do you do to stay positive during that time? If you also want to state your thoughts on what the Lions should do to rebuild. I'm all ears. I think that's a laughing emoji plus thumbs up, although it may be crying emoji. Before Breach goes on a 40-minute rant about what it's like to be a Bengals fan, I'll just give you – because my teams are generally pretty popular, uh, successful, I should say. But uh, Oh, my God. At, Will, by the way, Wilson ran a blog called – You say this every six months. Sox, Steelers, Heels, dot heels, blog heels, spot. Heels, Sox, Steelers. It's still there. That is a repulsive three teams, by the way. Uh, but here's the thing. I am a Tar Heels basketball fan. I don't, I didn't grow up. I didn't care so much about Tar Heels <laughs> football, probably because they were terrible. But, um, growing up in North Carolina during Michael Jordan's heyday, I was eight or nine. But anyway, uh, the 2001 2002 season, UNC Tar Heels basketball with the illustrious Matt Doherty as coach, one of the worst decisions ever, uh, in Carolina basketball history. That team went eight and 20. 
And this is a little tougher if you're a Lions fan because this is asking you to do. Are, are, I'm, I'm sorry. Are you tossing up Carolina's one lone bad season? In no, the he's asking how you dealt with it as a, as a way to deal with your struggles. No, are you kidding me? No, I'm not done. He's asking you how, you, how you dealt me? with it. Here's what a Lions I, fan. You're like, well, one time the, the Carolina only won eight games and then they got back with five more championships <laughs> in the next decade. I didn't finish. Okay, finish. <laughs> And then they bounced back with two more championships, not five. And so then I drank some more Pinot Grigio and had some Gruyere. Gr you're, you're wearing a master it, shirt. It's not, it's not a player. It's not, it's not, it's not, I mean, let's here. be honest here, Ryan. Can I've I been cheering for a team that has 31 oh, oh, rough years. Oh, oh. Before we get to the big, look, this is no, it's a, this is the Bengals are clearly the big choice. I want to say, can I just finish? I just want yeah, to finish yeah. my point. So I, they went eight and 20. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's some of the names from that team. I had to look it up because I tried to block it out. Chris Lang. Remember Chris Lang? Yeah, of course. Adam Boone used to That's make my himself. favorite Carolina season of all time. Exactly. Of I Matt Doherty was the disaster. And it is unfair to ask a Lions fan or even a Bengals fan to do this, but I made myself watch every single game because I knew they would turn it around at some point. So I sat through all 28 disastrous games, every, ass whooping they took because I knew there'd be sunny days. But as I, as the words leave my mouth, I understand as a Lions fan, that's not an option for your mental health. As a Bengals fan, I know Breach doesn't watch every single minute of the Bengals games, probably for his mental health. I get that. But that's what I did. That was my personal experience because I was answering the question. So there you go. Okay, so look, just for, for the record, I mean, I, I'm not, it, it, the only, I wouldn't care that you're your example, except it's ridiculous because it's Carolina. Like they fired Matt Doherty after one more year after the 8-20 and 20 season. And it like, Honest to God, I mean, I was in college and we all at NC State, we all thought that the Carolina, we're like, it's over, it's over, Carolina's done. And right. then Michael Jordan called Roy Williams and said, because Carolina tried to get him to come from Kansas when uh, when Dean retired, and he said no. He called him and said, Roy, it's time to come home. And Roy, despite not wanting to leave Kansas, left Kansas. Won a national title in his second year. And then so the two years after Ryan's horrible eight-win season, they won a national title. And then he won another national title in 2008. And by the way, he's been to two more national title games uh, since then. I want to quickly point out that I feel your pain as a, as a Lions fan. As an NC State, sucks. We are mediocre. We are the definition of mediocrity. Not breach the definition of like, 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 bottom of the barrel like the Bengals, but NC State is just medi mediocre. We're always just average. Never overachieved. NC State has won a national title. In 1983. Does that count? No, those don't count? That is more recent than both the Lions and Bengals have won a championship. <laughs> what? Oh, the 80-yard kicker just dunked on you. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that, so as a kid, I grew up as a Duke fan. And which is I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah natural. But so like uh, I was born in 1981. I love Christian Leitner. I love Christian Leitner. So of course you did. in 1991 and 1992, my favorite as a 10 and 11 year old, my favorite team in sports won a national title game. I have a signed uh, ball right here by the 1992 Duke team. Christian Leitner, baby. Bobby, I went to Bobby Hurley basketball camp. Total douche. Let me tell you a quick story about that 92 team. Okay. It didn't take two seconds. I was at William Mary. I was a freshman. I knew one of the basketball players from Greensboro, Thomas Roberts, who played for William, for William Mary. Got me tickets over Christmas break. I sat like second row behind the bench at Cameron Indoor Stadium. Yeah. The first five times, and, and uh, William Mary's a Division One team. The first five da times down the court were all Grant Hill dunks. And oh my! God. Grant Hill's my favorite. You're like, okay, that team is a lot better than this team, and it's not even close. Yeah. So I got two national titles there in 1995. The Braves, who were a great team in like my early teens, won a won a won a uh, World Series. In at, at the age of 14, I was under the impression that you just won titles, you know, titles are just, you just get titles. It happens all the time. A lot of it, lot, you know, here's a title. Here's a title. I find this it guy is believe. a Lions fan. He doesn't even know what a title is. I know, I, but, but what I'm I saying, find, is that, I find like, it hard to believe that Brenton grew up in title, but go ahead. Right. So, entitled <laughs> to titles. And then I went to college and I became an NC state fan. And I got to tell you, I mean, like, I, I mean, like those titles feel like a long time ago and aren't as meaningful as, as an NC state title would be like, I feel your pain. It is, it's almost better to have be like breach to have never loved than to actually have loved and lost. I, I mean, see, basically this guy is asking, Hey, I have a gunshot wound. I want to know how to rehab. And you guys got paper cuts once <laughs> and are trying to empathize Just with put him. a band aid on it. You'll be fine. <laughs> no, 
just hire Roy Williams. No, I mean, this, is this uh, we don't know how old Brandon Worth is, but I think I'm probably the only one that can relate to him because if he is under the age of 30, he has never seen the Lions win a playoff game. If he's under the age of 50, which I'm assuming he is, he's seen them win one playoff game. It's miserable. The only way I stay happy is by drinking. Uh, the Bengals have driven me to alcoholism. I'm saying, no, it's not that bad, but... Uh, you know what is funny is that usually at the end of the season, especially a year, you know, the Bengals went four, 11 and one, they lost their starting quarterback to injury. Uh, it's another lost season. And you're thinking, will anything positive ever happen? And what I do is I just watch a highlight video and I'm like, okay, so they're good. Sometimes <laughs> they are capable of making good plays. If they could make multiple good plays in the same game, maybe they'll be good next year. And the thing I love about the NFL is that it really does feel like you have a chance every year even if you really don't like you i was i, I, will... I, I was going to ask you so do, do you feel every off season right around this time right around free agency in the draft that okay this is the year they can put it all together the Bengals can i i mean last year i thought they could finish third place top so i didn't think they were and i said you know like i don't remember what i told you guys like eight and eight i said 10 and six was their ceiling but i thought they'd go like <laughs> six and ten or seven and nine and so like try to be a little bit realistic and I, so I didn't have high expectations last year but like I genuinely think they could compete for a playoff spot this year my optimism is high and if you're a Lions fan you should feel the same way and that's the thing in the NFL anything can happen we just saw Washington win the NFC East with a seven and nine record and they played like four starting quarterbacks so if you can win a division with four starting quarterbacks uh that means anything is possible so Brandon just keep sucking it up man Hopefully the, the Lions get a playoff win before you turn like 70. As for a rebuild, I mean, honestly, I think one of the problems with the Lions, and this is true of like a lot of broken franchises, is that all the external problems and on-field problems are probably, probably cover up some of the things that are wrong inside the building. You know what I mean? Like, I think that, the, like, the, I think, the, who's the personnel guy? I always forget his name, but he's the team president. He's like, I'm not a football guy. I don't really get into, you know, I'm not making into football. And then he was like involved in cutting Marvin Hall last year. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. You're so I think the Lions have that going on. And I'm a little worried that it's not going to fix itself. I honestly, you sort of have to get lucky and hope that um, with Carver. Jared Goff serving as a bridge quarterback, you can find another quarterback. They need some stability. They need some. And by the way, Dan Campbell doesn't scream stability, but maybe he's the exact exact opposite of Matt Patricia. So maybe that's what they need. I mean, it's just so hard to tell. The Patricia, well, and that's, hire, if I was a Lions coach, I would be excited. Or if I was a Lions fan, I would be excited about Dan Campbell because you're getting like that enthusiasm, that craziness that you kind of want to embrace that gets you excited about the season. Dan Campbell might be a flop, but he is going to be a spectacular flop if right. he does flop. And that's at least something to be exciting about. I feel like the Lions had kind of made stride. I mean, they went went nine and seven, right? Back to back years. Really? Did they? You heard I mean, I'm saying like they'd kind of made strides and then Patricia and Bob Quinn really set them back. So what you hope is that that was just two guys being terrible at their jobs. And, but that's been the conversation for as breaches noted for the last 30 years, two guys <laughs> being terrible at their jobs and just torpedo in the organization one way or another. And, and, here's, and here's some hope. Aaron Rodgers is old. How about that? Yeah, oh boy. Hey, once Aaron Rodgers is out of that division, that it's wide open. You know, like you're up against Kirk Cousins, whatever the Bears have at quarterback. You say that, but we just had a conversation about two years ago. Andrew looks to retire, and Carson Wentz is going to. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen. Like, that I mean, Tom Brady could go play true. for the Packers. No. He could go play for the Lions. He could go play for the Lions. Motown. Ryan. Maybe he wants to revive Motown. Don't He's done everything Lions. else in his career. It's time to save save the Lions. Save Detroit. All right, we got to bounce because Wilson has soccer practice. <laughs> yeah, me personally. One man soccer practice. I gotta take my kids soccer practice. But before we go, I should point out the Mount Paramount. You've seen it? Mount Paramount with uh, mm -hmm. Bill Cowher, James Corden, Patrick Stewart, and Beavis and Butthead. Yes, it is a, quite the squad. And they are repping at the top of the mountain Paramount Plus live sports, breaking news, and a mountain of entertainment. Go straight from the game day to movie night. Paramount Plus stream iconic movies like The Godfather, Indiana Jones and Mission Impossible, plus new episodes of critically acclaimed original series like Star Trek, Picard, The Good Fight, and The Stand. And if you want to dive into live athletic competition from us at CBS Sports, you will can do so with the NFL, March Madness, the Masters, and Champions League Soccer, plus stream hit shows from CBS, Nickelodeon, NTV, BET, Smithsonian Channel, Comedy Central, live sports, breaking news, and a mountain of entertainment. Paramount Plus is streaming now. What's the best thing you've watched on Paramount Plus in the last week, Wilson, because we are 
I, they should be trotting us out for these ads because we watch it. You know what I watched last night for real? Hawaii Five O. <laughs> old you. school, old school Hawaii Five O. That's pretty uh, good. Yeah, I never that, that was never my jam back in the day. It's a little before my time in the seventies, but uh, yeah, it was good, man. It was good. All right, Breach, lie about one thing you've watched on Paramount Plus in the last week. Uh, I watched Aerial America Alabama because we were mad because it is never on TV. So we watched it on it's it's where they show all the state from like oh, yeah, up yeah. high it, and they give you thing. facts about it. And like we see all of the states come up and my wife is from Alabama. And we're like, why don't they ever show Alabama on the Smithsonian Channel? And we're like, maybe it's on the app. And it was on the app. So we watched it. Aerial America is great Thanks. napping programming. It's very calm. And it was, we watched it on Saturday. That's oh, that's the best time to watch it. I will say that the other thing that you can check out, and uh, you know, part of this Viacom family, the Showtime app, you can install it on your smart TV. Your billions, Honor. billions, and billions and billions. Your Honor with uh, Walter White is also very good. I started that. Oh my goodness, that first scene is uh, oh lord, dark. And Have mercy. today's March twelfth. Get your free thirty days right now because that will take you through the end of the Masters, which ends on April eleventh. You get all your sports. Then you should decide to keep it after that. Uh, but you'll get uh, this is the perfect time to sign up for that free thirty days. Yep, and that's right. Uh, and if you tweet. Uh, your favorite Bengals player to breach at John breach. He will give you a free month of Paramount plus. So go do that. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. We will talk to you Monday.